So today we have a major rules preview as to how the Grand Tournament pack is going to shake things up, fortifications get a boost, there's a bunch more clarifications to missions, and we've got official confirmation of the sub-faction ban, no more mixing detachments within the same codex. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where Chapter Approved is going on pre-order tomorrow, and today Games Workshop have shown off a bunch of rules previews as to how it's going to actually change army construction and how you can field certain units. I'd say the two biggest bits of news are the change in the way that you can deploy fortifications, and some really good clarification on this mixed sub-faction ban, but we'll start with talking about a few little hints and teasers throughout the article. So first up for missions, we basically did know that the primaries are going to be changing, the main objective one is only going to be scored up to a maximum of 12 each turn, and they're going to be getting a second primary objective to make up the shortfall, so it kind of feels like you're going to have four secondaries in play rather than three. To go along with that, they've shown us another example mission, this one the revamped version of the scouring, and they've shown us off another one of these bonus primary objectives, this one called strategic scan. All the objectives in this mission appear to be in no man's land, and it does look like it could be a bit of a gruelling fight for the centre of the table, really not incentivising you to sit in your own deployment zone. The secondary on this one is to try and do actions while you're fighting for those objectives. There's an action called Allspec Scan. Besides having a great name, it's basically a sort of defend action. You start it at the end of your movement phase, so you could move a unit onto it to do it. Start the action, and it completes at the start of your next command phase, so your opponent basically gets a chance to gun you off the objective. For each objective marker that you scan, you get 3 victory points. I feel that is one that's going to reward the person who's dominating the objective markers the most. If you manage to slog up into the centre of the table, and they still have units free to do actions, then it looks like you're doing quite well. Overall, it looks like an interesting one, a bit of a gruelling fight for the centre of the table to me. Secondaries wise, they have given us confirmation of that rumour from White Dwarf, basically saying that Space Marines aren't going to be able to double dip on their secondaries for having two different codexes. The way that they've worded the objective is that at least two of your secondary objectives must be picked from the mission pack, so the ones available in this Grand Ornament book, so that only leaves you one available if you want to pick one from a codex. That one definitely makes sense to me. All the other factions can only take one bonus secondary, so why should Space Marines get more, particularly when they already have better choices for quite a lot of their codexes? Next up, in a weird kind of non-preview, they've talked about Super Heavy Auxiliary Detachments gaining a command point bonus. I don't really know in what way the Warhammer community have got confused about this, but they're talking about Super Heavy Auxiliary Detachments getting a 2 command point bonus if they're the same faction as your Warlord, and that was already a change that was implemented in the last chapter approved back in 2021. I guess it makes sense that the rule would be reprinted in this book, but it's not exactly a new change. It'd be much bigger news if this applied to the actual Super Heavy Detachment, the one where you can get 3-5 to five Lords of War, and to be honest I'm not sure that will be such a bad change to be honest. With its enormous 6 command point price tag you very rarely see it fielded. I don't think I'd be against them dropping that main detachment's command point cost to 4, but that doesn't appear to be what they're talking about here. Finally we do have news of when the next balance data slate comes out. That was certainly a question I had on my mind, seeing as you're basically getting a big rules and points update right here to rebalance the game and it kind of might make the balanced data slates changes a touch redundant. In any case, apparently there is going to be a fair gap between chapter approved and that, the balanced data slate will come towards the end of February, and we'll have a few further changes, though nothing quite as wide reaching as chapter approved itself. I guess with all the points cost changing, things might really be up in the air for a bit, it'll be interesting to see whether or not they buff or nerf any factions as a whole after chapter approved has gone through. Let's get on to the two major changes though, and we'll start with the fortifications. I did make a video of a bit of a fortification overview in 9th edition recently. In general there are things that's there in the game that not all that many people tend to make use of. Some of them are fairly solid for the points, but they're kind of hampered by an annoying rule that came out in an FAQ not long after the core rulebook dropped, basically stating that when fortifications deploy, they must deploy at least 3 inches away from any terrain on the table aside from hills. I think the main reason for this is to try and stop them being used as annoying movement blockers, perhaps just setting them up a tiny bit away from a terrain piece, which stops enemy models from moving through. I can see why that could get a bit silly, particularly when a fair few of the fortifications are kind of essentially terrain pieces and can't be destroyed as the direct result of attacks. That rule does mean that you often have very limited positions where you can actually deploy fortifications though, and with a fairly dense level of terrain on the table in 9th edition, it sometimes means that you might not even be able to deploy them at all anywhere on the board if you're going rules as written. To start with, it seems that they haven't got rid of that previous rule, but they have augmented it slightly, 
to mean that you should at least be able to deploy most of the normal size fortifications on just about any standard board. Basically, if you come to a game and there's literally nowhere that you can put the fortification down, then you basically get to trade out one bit of area terrain or obstacle within your deployment zone and put the fortification down where it was instead. In general, I think for most boards that would mean that you can deploy most normal size fortifications, though sometimes I think you might still struggle with something that's truly colossal, something like a Fortress of Redemption. In general, I think that this does help fortifications become a little bit more reliably usable in-game. At least you can near enough guarantee that you will be able to set the thing up, but depending on the map that you're playing on, you still run the risk of them being kind of irrelevant. Sometimes it might be beneficial to swap out a piece of area terrain, sometimes the piece of area terrain might be so useful that you actually want that instead of the fortification, and you still might be able to get the worst of both worlds of this rule. Maybe say if you had one tiny and slightly irrelevant place to put your fortification, say you were forced to drop it right in one far-flung corner of a battlefield, then the fortification might still be completely useless because it's been zoned out of going anywhere useful, and you don't even have the option of trading it out for an area terrain piece. I do wonder if they might have just gone one step further, and just say that you could swap out any one area terrain piece for fortifications if you wanted, though I guess I can see that leading to slightly gamey situations, maybe using them to block line of sight to key objectives that you wouldn't normally be able to do that on. I certainly could imagine the obscuring cysts of battle battle sanctums being very very popular with that kind of rule. I think just fortifications are kind of hard to balance right in games where quite a lot of tournaments are using fixed terrain maps to set up games. Still though, depending on the game that you're playing and whether or not this rule triggers, it certainly adds a decent amount of reliability to fortifications, and I think that on the whole the rule is definitely a positive change. Finally, for me, and what I consider the biggest army construction change that comes with chapter approved, is the fact that mixed sub-factions within an army are essentially banned in competitive play now. I talked about this rumour at the end of last week, and it does appear to be accurate, official confirmation coming from Games Workshop today. Basically it means that if you've got one codex, you can't have two different sub-factions within that same codex. Say for example you can't have White Scars fighting alongside Iron Hands anymore, that's just gone. I will try and keep this in perspective, it is only for tournament competitive play. I believe just for missions using this Grand Tournament mission pack. To my knowledge you're fine to do exactly what you want in open or narrative play, or even in more general match play that doesn't use these missions. In general though, I do like to use these missions when they come out, they do feel like the most current form of the game, and I feel like they will see a lot of widespread adoption. The way that the rule works now is that if you have a sub-faction keyword, such as chapter or regiment, you have to swap it out for the entire army, you can't pick and choose as per individual units or whole detachments. It means say if you want to include any Imperial Guard in your army, you'd have to choose their entire regiment to say be Armageddon Steel Legion, or maybe one of the custom regiments, he can't have say one detachment of Katachans and one detachment of Cadians within the same list. There are some exceptions to the rule apparently, things that aren't really sub-faction rules don't get affected by this, such as Mark of Chaos or Demon Allegiance rules, they're not stopping you from having mixed armies of say Korn, Zinch and Slanesh, and anything that doesn't have the same sub-faction keyword isn't actually going to be affected either, so it won't affect Drakari having one Witch Cult, one Coven and one Cabal though it does mean that you couldn't say mix two different homunculus covens, say for example the Artists of Flesh one for the minus one damage in one detachment, and Dark Technomancers for the extra damage boost in another. It also doesn't look like it would affect say Guard Scion regiments, you could say have a detachment of Imperial Guard Voss drones alongside a Capic Eagle Scion regiment, as I believe that they have a Scion regiment keyword that's different to the standard regiment one. However, I do think that this really changes the way that you can play quite a lot of armies, Grey Knights are not going to be able to spam three different patrols of different Brotherhoods to gain different bonuses. Sisters of Battle aren't just going to be able to take a detachment of Bloody Rose for all their combat units and put everything else in a different one. You won't be able to see Orc Clans working together, say Freebooters alongside some Evil Sons, or two Necron factions of different dynasties fighting alongside. In particular, if your Codex doesn't have allies outside of their Codex, you're going to be quite restricted by this, I think. I don't think it's amazing news for certain armies like Necrons, Tau, Orcs or Tyranids who only have limited ally opportunities, and now you're just going to be locked to one faction within your codex. Personally, I feel like this change is going to divide people, I think some people will hate it, some people will love it, I think it's just generally going to depend on how you like to build armies. I think I must admit I do fall into the slightly negative view of this myself, but I think there are positives and negatives to the change. On the positive side, it does mean that armies will look very cohesive now, the best thing isn't going to be to farm two different soup detachments from the same codex if you want to be optimal, and the sub-factions that you pick really do have to play with their strengths and weaknesses. 
it does stop a bit of cherry picking and just having the best of both worlds. However, I do feel that it makes army construction a fair bit less interesting, particularly for the factions who have limited out of codex allies. It means that you basically have to lock yourself into just one sub faction, you can't play around and have a few options from both, and I feel it maybe hurts the Xenos armies the most, as they don't have other out of codex allies that they can call upon if it does make sense to mix and match. As well as that, I think it does kill some perfectly fluffy combos as well. Imperial Guard regiments have a long history of fighting alongside fellows from different parts of the galaxy. Orcs will often make war with multiple clans represented, constantly trying to outdo each other. I see absolutely no reason why two Space Marine forces of different chapters couldn't team up. You do lose things like Super Doctrines and things, so it isn't all a positive. And the same goes for really quite a lot of other armies. Broadly, I think that this is a little bit punitive myself. I feel like it has the potential to make quite a lot of people unhappy if they have built one of these fluffy composite forces and they now find it invalidated for competitive play. I think if I'd been trying to tone these down a bit, I would have put a bit more of a command point detachment on it myself. Say, if you want to have two different keywords, then maybe you could have had a three command point tax or something like that. I feel that could have been a really good way to represent that, as basically having disparate forces not working together quite as well, as well as the cost of paying for the different detachments. That way you could make souping armies cost a bit more resources without completely removing it as an option altogether for people who want to do it for narrative reasons or just to add a bit of different interest to army construction. I'll be interested to hear what you guys have to say though. As I said, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are going to love the change and a lot of people who are really not going to like it. So overall, some pretty interesting stuff here. I will of course be combing through chapter approved once I get a chance and seeing if there's any other changes that they haven't told us about before. They haven't mentioned anything about changes to patrol detachments, which were also rumoured. I guess we'll have to wait and see whether or not that's real, or whether it was just a false whispering from the internet. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I'm looking forward to making a fair few videos on the updated points in Chapter Approved. And finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page, and you can find that down in the video description below. Channel patrons get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways, with a chance to win some big model kits every single month. The channel's backers on Patreon are what allow me to basically keep on doing this full time, so if you are enjoying regularly, any support is enormously appreciated. Feel free to check that out down in the video description if you're interested. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I most certainly hope to see you guys next time.